And first, we're going to have Chiyuki Aou, who's a professor of international security at the University of Tokyo. Um, Chiyuki, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. I'll just, yeah. Good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your kind introduction. And I'm Chiki Aoi from University of Tokyo. I'm very happy to be here, very honored to be here. Um, Today, I'm included in this panel on East Asia, but my uh, academic expertise is on international security. Um, and it, therefore, I would like to include some more a global perspective to discuss East Asian uh, regional issues. So uh, my lecture, I mean, sorry, my, my, my um, talk is entitled Creation of a Rules-Based Order, Values and Contemporary Foreign Security Policy. And I would like to first say all views expressed here are my, my own academic independent opinion, and they do not represent my home institution, or although I had held an advisory position for the current Japanese administration in the Council on Security and Defense Capabilities, um, my views are my own. So today, I would like to stick to the uh, order to keep the uh, talk very short within seven, eight minutes. So I will discuss the following three issues. First issue is that generally, I would argue that most uh, uh, currently, uh, values play a very important role in foreign and defense policy. They always have, but I think for a number of reasons, it's more important today. And secondly, I would like to discuss some key features of the uh, ongoing current Japanese National Defense Program guideline um, and relationship that uh, re relationship uh, between that and Japan's values-driven strategy. And thirdly, I will address some of the challenges facing values-based uh, foreign and defense policy. Okay, uh, foreign policies have always been implicitly, explicitly linked to values, so there's nothing new in this. However, uh, interests, including national interests, have links to values. Values can be anything, and they do not necessarily have to be liberal, although we do uh, wind up talking about material national interest and liberal values. Values can be anything, I think. So uh, very often, foreign policy and defense policy are uh, really deeply entwined with uh, our values. Um, as mentioned throughout this conference, however, it is the currents over time that liberal ideals and values are intensely challenged from uh, within, from um, forces favoring populism and unilateralism as opposed to multilateralism, and also from outside, from entities that challenge fundamentally liberal ways of managing political relations. It is hence natural that the defense policies also have to come to involve defense of values. Because so much of our foreign defense policies have to do with the defense of values, there is a need to communicate, sorry, there is a need to communicate uh, well what these values are, that what we are defending, hence the importance of strategic communications. It is particularly important to explain and justify actions because particularly uh, actions started to involve a form of issue linkages uh, such as the use of geoeconomics that go across traditional boundaries uh, of strategy, whether that is a preference or not. Very often, communications replace physical force. They do so by manipulating or subverting the way physical force is perceived or the way calculations are made regarding escalation and disc escalation in military confrontations of, have, as, as was so in Ukraine. Further, democracies are particularly affected by the advent of um, information and communication technologies. Uh, for example, the spread of social media, the availability of cyberspace, and globalization. Well, I hope you can see it. Um, okay, I think these features that I just mentioned provide for a very important background to the ongoing 
Japanese National Defense Program guideline. I was um, an advisor in the council that advised the revision of the document, and this document, in case you do not know, this is, a, a, for example, in the United Kingdom, it's equivalent to the Strategic and Defense Review. Uh, this is a document, doctrine, uh, that justifies the uh, use of defense budget, and in the case of Japan, it sits directly below a uh, national security strategy, which was adopted back in 2013. So we re revised this at the, at the end of last year. So uh, I would like to highlight some of the key features, uh, only the, uh, the relevant ones uh, in my talk. So NGPD, uh, National Defense Program Guideline, uh, adopted a new multi-domain strategy that encompasses a new focus on cyber, space, and electromagnetics. And of course, these are going to be a game changer in the coming 10 years or so. Uh, so therefore, it's natural that this is included. But to my view, it is also important that it has the current program guidelines has redefined Japan's defense purpose, purpose to have specific streamlined links with particular defense activities, uh, which I argue will have implications for Japan's values-driven strategy. So uh, Japan has now three new defense purposes. Uh, first purpose is to create security environment. So that's, uh, that is desirable for Japan. Uh, and Japan will use a uh, whole of government capabilities to achieve this uh, goal. A second goal is to deter threats from reaching Japan, and the third goal is counter the threat and minimize damage in case deterrence fails. Um, these purposes are, needless to say, mutually reinforcing. And of these, the first category, the first purpose, the create category is new. Uh, the new uh, one justifies meaning, for example, to uh, Japanese self-defense force, that's a military self-defense force activities in uh, what are essentially defense engagement activities, normally capacity building, defense diplomacy, peace operations, uh, whatever. Um, these before, uh, these are, are termed security cooperation in Japan. Uh, before, these activities surprisingly have no explicit link to Japanese defense purpose. Now they do have a proper home to belong. Um, what is important is that these, these create activities now can uh, reinforce Japan's values-driven strategy to uh, realize its foreign policy and defense goals. Japan's values-driven strategies have taken many forms in the last decade and a half, but currently the most important initiative is a free and open Indo-Pacific uh, for it. Among European powers, France and the UK are major partners in this initiative. In the region, in the Asian Pacific region, uh, Japan's ties with um, India, Australia, as well as the US are firmly established in this context, and all these partners are keen to develop mutual relations. And the new, I, I do believe that the region, new regional bloc called the Indo-Pacific is really on the rise. Um, but it should be noted that the FOIP is originated by the Japanese, and following a decade and, and a half earlier, of values-driven initiative of, on art of freedom initiative. And so the origin of Japanese values-driven strategy predates the current preoccupation with China. The Japanese initiative FOIP approach is also different from a uh, more military and alliance-oriented uh, approach taken currently by the United States. Japan's FOIP comprise the principles of rules-based order, particularly in the maritime domain, sustainability, and local ownership in ODA and investment. Okay, so my, I know my time is very limited, so let me jump to the discussion of challenges in lieu of conclusions. So to create rules-based order, to talk about it is, is rather abstract. So I think the major question that comes to everyone's mind is what rules and what uh, order are we really talking about? So um, we must, that, that's the purpose, I think, the whole of values-based strategy. Uh, we must uh, together uh, with like-minded countries and with your local partners and others uh, to, to, together define what these rules uh, may entail. For example, there are significant disagreements among great powers in the region regarding what those orders and rules are. And in bilateral relations within the region as well, there are significant policy discrepancies. For example, policy towards Southeast Asia, for example, among European and Japanese and Australian US powers, for example, always involved uh, tensions between the pursuit of values such as democracy, human rights, and so-called constructive engagement. Specifically, bilateral policy 
among Western nations historically differs, for example, regarding Myanmar. And secondly, hence, there is a challenge of coordinating policy among so-called like-minded countries, lack of engagement with each other among this grouping, and with also local partners in carrying out various policies and projects are a continuous concern. FOIP in this context should be conceived as a main vehicle to get allies and partners on board uh, along the common path. So concrete projects must be jointly managed, relations with key actors in the region must be coordinated. In this sense, FOIP is a very much a shaping activity. Uh, it's a multilateral activity by nature. Uh, lastly, uh, I think uh, I'm uh, personally concerned about the trend of regional realism, um, uh, which means that basically we don't have time to deal with issues that are belonging to, that are concerns for other regions. For example, in Asia, I'm talking about North Korea, uh, the ascent of China as a superpower all the time, while neglecting issues and challenges facing Europe and vice versa. I think that's a very dangerous trend. I think we need to uh, talk to each other, share concerns, and uh, maybe perhaps together uh, jointly develop the notion of what is a rules-based order, because I think Europe and Japan are together in working on this notion. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Very well done. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Um, thank you for that broad view. Yeah.